Okay. Um, good afternoon. So our lecture for the day is uh, cardiology physiology. So this is the normal structure of the heart. So it is composed of uh, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. So all your unoxygenated blood from the upper extremities will enter the superior vena cava and those from the lower extremities will enter the inferior vena cava. So your right atrium will receive the deoxygenated blood from the superior and inferior vena cava. Then the deoxygenated blood from the right atrium flows through the tricuspid bulb into the right ventricle. So from the right ventricle, it will enter the, the lungs via the pulmonary bulb. So in the lungs, the deoxygenated blood will become oxygen rich through the oxygenation from the lungs. So the, the blood will send back to the heart via the pulmonary veins, which is uh, composed of four pulmonary veins, and it will enter your left atrium. So from your left atrium, it will enter your uh, left ventricle via the mitral bulb. Then it, the, from the left ventricle, it will be distributed to the different parts of the body via the aorta. So this is the electrical system of the heart. So it is com uh, uh, so your uh, your pacemaker will be your sinus uh, sinoatrial node, which is located in the atrium in the junction of your superior vena cava, which is responsible for the generation of the electrical impulses. So these impulses are then transmitted to the atrial conduction tissue to the atrioventricular node. So your atrioventricular node will cause a slight delay in transmission and then allows the signal to travel to the cells of the interventricular septum. So from your AB node, it will be distributed to your right and left via the bundle branch. So from your bundle branch, it will be uh, transmitted into the respective ventricles no, from your right and the left. And further, it will be distributed through the different parts of the ventricles via the Perkin J fibers. So this is the cardiac action potential. So your, uh, your cardiac action potential, uh, which is uh, composed of your, uh, this is the sample of your uh, cardiac potential, which has a plateau. No? So this is the uh, cardiac action potential of the Perkin J fibers. And the blue one is the uh, cardiac action potential of the ventricular muscle. So uh, this is the cardiac potential, which is composed of phases. So it will start at phase four, which is we call it the resting membrane potential. And uh, the normal resting membrane potential in the ventricular myocardium is about 85 to 95 millivolts. So the membrane is permeable to potassium. Then uh, P0, which is the, we call it the rapid uh, depolarization phase. So the phase is due to the opening of the past potassium uh, channels causing a rapid increase in the membrane conductance to sodium channels. So thus the rapid influx of your sodium ions into the cell. So there is an increase, no, inward increase of your sodium uh, current. So your phase two of the action potential occurs with the inactivation of your uh, channels. So the transient net outward current causing the small downward deflection. No, this is the, the small downward deflection uh, of the action potential is due to the movement of your potassium and chloride. So your potassium and chloride will go up from the cell, which is carried out by the uh, ions, no, the, uh, the, the I212 uh, currents respectively. So Particularly, the, pot, the ions contribute to the notch of the ventricular cardiomyocyte action potential. So this is your notch. So next is the phase two. The phase two is the action potential caused by a large quantity of both calcium and sodium ions, which flows through these channels to the interior of the cardiac muscle fiber. And this maintains a prolonged period of depolarization. 
So next is your phase three. We call it the rapid repolarization phase of the action potential. So it is composed of L-type uh, channels, which is uh, responsible in the uh, in the outward uh, flow of your potassium. No, there is a slow. Uh, rectifying channels, which is your potassium and your potassium rapid uh, delayed or inward uh, rectifying uh, channels. So immediately after the onset of the action potential, the permeability of the action of the cardiac muscle membrane for potassium ions decreases about fivefold. So an effect that does not occur in the skeletal muscle. So this decrease the potassium permeability may result from the excess calcium influx through the calcium channels, uh, which is noted in the cardiac muscles. So regardless of the cause, there is a decrease in the potassium permeability that greatly decrease the outflux of your potassium charge pot uh, potassium ions during the action potential uh, plateau. So this is your action potential. Next is, okay. So this one is the uh, force of ventricular heart muscle contraction. So it is composed of your refractory period, your relative refractory period, and your uh, early and late premature contraction. So your early and late premature contraction are the abnormalities of your ventricles that can be seen in your ECGs. So your refractory period is the in interval of time during which the normal cardiac impulse cannot re-excite an already excited area of cardiac muscle. So the ventricles, the value of your refractory period is 0.25 to 0 0.3 seconds. For your atria, it is 0 0.15 seconds, which is apparent in your ECGs. So your atria represents your P wave and your ventricle represents the QRS complexes. So the normal value for atria is 0 0.15, which is, represent, uh, which is the normal value of your PR interval. Next is your rep, uh, relative refractory period. So this period uh, is during which the muscle is more difficult than normal to excite. So if there is a abnormality in the conduction of the electrical impulse from your, uh, from your uh, cardiac muscle, so there will be early premature contraction or we call it the PBCs in ECGs. So next is your heart is uh, has a calcium channels. No, it is uh, L-type calcium channels that triggers the 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 influx of your calcium. So it has two channels. No, the the hydropyridine receptor and the rionidine receptor. So seventy percent of your intracellular calcium is from your sarcoplasmic reticulum and 30% is from your calcium influx through the sarcolemma. So next is, this is the transverse tubules of your uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. I think this was already discussed during your lecture in the cardiac muscle. So I will not dwell more on this. So next is, this is the, the excitation contraction coupling. So once the action potential spreads into the muscle fibers along the membranes of your transverse tubules, so it will act on the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So uh, to cause the release of your calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So your calcium will, will act from your sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there's a large uh, quantity of extra calcium ions diffuses from the sarcoplasm from the T tubules at the time of action potential. So calcium ions diffuse into the myofibrils and catalyze the chemical reactions that promote sliding of the actin and myosin filaments along one another causing muscle contraction. So at the end of the plateau of the cardiac action potential, the influx of calcium ions to the muscle fibers stops. 
then the calcium ions in the sarcoplasm are rapidly pumped back out of the muscle fibers into both the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the T tubules, which is the extracellular fluid that causing the muscle relaxation. So that is your excitation, contraction, crumpling, which is secondary to the action of your calcium channels. And uh, next is, this is your cardiac cycle. So your cardiac cycle is an event that occurs between one heart contraction and the next. So this cycle is divided into two phases, your relaxation and the contraction phase. So the, re the relaxation phase of the cardiac cycle is known as the diastole, which is characterized by feeling of your ventricles. The second part of the cardiac cycle is known as the systole. So this is your, uh, this part is the diastole and this part is the systole. So during systole, the, uh, the, during systole, the heart contraction and forces the blood into the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So the diastole, begins with the closing of your semilunar bulb. So your, this one, this, uh, the isovolumic uh, lumic contraction will start at the closing of the semilunar bulb. So, and the opening of the atroventricular bulb. So this allow the pressure in the ventricles to become low enough to allow blood to enter from the atria. Towards the end of the diastole, the atria gives a quick contraction to finish the emptying of the blood into the ventricle. So this is known as the atrial click and helps to boost uh, cardiac output. So the next uh, part is the ventricles will receive a stimulus to contract, which increases uh, the interventricular pressure. So in this graph, you will notice that uh, there will be an increase in the pressure. This one is the pressure, no, the ventricular pressure. So once the uh, there's an already atrial click, so there will be increase in the ventricular pressure. So this increased pressure forces the mitral and the tricuspid bulb to close and opens the semilunar uh, bulbs to allow blood to, allow, to flow out of the pulmonary and systemic circulation. So when the pressure in the pulmonary artery and the aorta overcomes the pressure in the ventricles, the semilunar bulb closes and the atroventricular bulbs open, making the beginning of the diastole and the start of the new cardiac mass, uh, cycle. So the red one is your ventricular pressure and this one is your atrial pressure. So you will notice that your atrial pressure has A, C, and B. So each wave is represented by the different uh, parts of the cardiac cycle. So your, your aortic uh, pressure is this one and uh, your ventricular and atrial pressure, there is a, uh, there is a representation from your ECGs. No? So we will discuss more on the representation of the ECG on the next topics. So we will discuss the cardiac cycle one by one. So first is the atrial systole. So your atrial systole is composed of, so it is represented by the P wave, no? This is your, uh, this is your P wave in your ECG, which is caused the atrial depolarization. And your, uh, this is your RA wave, which is the A wave, which is, uh, represents the atrial contra contraction causing increase in the venous pressure. So after the atrial contraction is complete, the atrial pressure begins to fall, causing a pressure, pressure gradient reversal across the AB bulb. So this causes the bulb to float outward before the closure. So at this time, the ventricular volume are maximal. So this is your ventricular volume which is the, we term it as the end diastolic volume or uh, the abbreviation for that is EDV. So the left ventricular end diastolic volume, which is typically 
the value is 120 ml, represents the ventricular uh, contraction. No? Uh, so, so the ventricular, so the end diastolic uh, volume is associated with the end diastolic pressure of 8 to 12 millimeter mercury and a 3 to 6 millimeter in the left and right ventricle. So your the pressure in your, so this is the volume. So the normal volume is 120. And this one is your pressure, which is uh, for the left ventricle, is a, it is 8 to 12. For the right ventricle, it is 3 to 6 uh, millimeter mercury. So... Uh, it is coincide with the atrial contraction, no? So this is the fourth sound, which is we call it the S4. This sound is caused by the vibration of the ventricular wall during atrial contraction. So generally, uh, the pressure uh, occurs in many of uh, so. Uh, you generally this S4 does not occur in many. Uh, individuals, no, they are usually can be found in adults, no, and also in units. Okay, next. Next is your isovolumetric uh, contraction. So this is represented by your QRS waves that appear as a result of ventricular depolarization. So your QRS, this is your QRS, which uh, which is uh, responsible for your isovolumetric contraction. So it initiates the ventricular systole that causing the increase in the ventricular pressure. So it is composed of C wave. No, this is your C wave in your right atrial pressure that occurs when the ventricles begin to contract. So it is represented by your S1, which is causing, which is caused by the AB bulb that closes no so that is the sound so in this uh in this uh uh in this diagram you will note that there is an additional 0 0.02 to 0 0.3 seconds that is required for the ventricle to build up, build up a sufficient pressure to push the semi lunar bulb which is your aorta and your pulmonary valves uh, against the pressure in the aorta and pulmonary. Next, next is your period of ejection. So this is where when the left ventricular pressure rises and this is where your aortic bulb opens and the blood that rapidly ejected into the aorta. So in effect, the, there will be a decrease in the ventricular volume of your ventricles and there will be a, in your ECG, there will be a T wave, which is represented by your ventricular repolarization. So this is your T wave. So next is your isovolumetric uh, or isometric relaxation. So this is the end of your systole. So it occurs when the ventricles relaxes. So it decreases the ventricular pressure and it is represented by your S2, which is the closing of your aorta and your pulmonary valve. And in your right atrial pressure, it is represented by B wave that occurs as a result from the slow flow of blood into the atria from the veins. Next is your ventricular feeling. So your ventricular feeling uh, is the phase wherein the ventricles continue to relax and the AB valves rapidly open and ventricular feeling begins. So ventricular volume increases and there is a rapid fall in the left atrial pressure. So this is the, the wave that represents the, the rapid flow of your, uh, of your uh, left atrial pressure and your aorta will, pressure will begin to fall. Okay, this diagram represents the relationship between the left ventricular volume and the interventricular pressure during the diastole and systole. So we will discuss this one by one. So this one, uh, this is the uh, ventricular 
This is the ventricular it's pressure, pressure uh, gradient. We're in uh, this, uh, this is composed of phase one until phase four. So your phase one, so your phase one is from uh, this, uh, uh, phase one is the volume pressure diagrams that begins as a, inter, as a ventricular volume of about 50 uh, millimeter and the diastolic pressure of two to three millimeter mercury. The amount of blood that remains in the ventricles after the peer, previous heartbeat, which is 50 millimeter, we call it the end diastolic volume. So this is the end diastolic volume. So as the venous blood flows into the ventricles from the left, left atrium, the ventricular volume normally increases about 20 millimeter, which is, we call it the end uh, diastolic uh, volume and an increase of 70 millimeters. So therefore, the volume pressure diagram during the phase one extends along the point A from point B. So from 50, it will increase to almost 120. We're in uh, from the, the bulb that's open, then after the period of peeling, your mitral bulb will close. So that is your phase one. Next is your uh, next is your phase two. We're in the this is the period of isobolometric contraction. So during isobolometric contraction, the volume of the ventricle does not change because all bulbs are closed. However, the pressure inside the ventricle increases to the uh, equal in the pressure in the aorta at a pressure value of 80 millimeter mercury. So from point B, it will increase the pressure, no? Then it will eventually open the pressure, the bulb of the aorta, which is this uh, isobolometric contraction or the phase two is uh, from point B to point C. Next is the phase three. So phase three, this is phase three. So phase three is from the uh, from point C to point D. So we call it the period of ejection. So during the ejection, the systolic pressure rises even higher because of the still more contraction of the ventricle. So at the same time, the volume of the ventricle decreases because the aortic bulb has now opened the blood volumes out of the ventricles into the aorta. So uh, this time, your once uh, the start of your period of ejection is the uh, point C, which is the your aortic bulb is open. Then after the feeling, uh, the aortic bulb will close as now once it reaches the maximum uh, effect. Next is the last phase is the phase four. So it is from point B and will go back to point A. So this is, we call it the period of isobolometric uh, relaxation. So at the end of the period of this period, uh, the aortic bulb closes and the ventricular pe uh, pressure falls back to the diastolic pressure level. So, the, uh, this decrease in the interventricular pressure without any change in volume. Thus, the ventricle returns to its starting point with a uh, above 50 millimeter of blood left in the ventricles and at the atrial pressure of uh, two to three millimeter mercury. So, so that is your that is the whole diagram no, of the left ventricular volume which is in comparison with the left and interventricular pressure. Okay, uh, next is uh, what is your stroke volume? So stroke volume is the difference between the end diastolic uh, volume and the uh, end systolic volume. So the factors that affect your stroke volume are your preload, contractility, and afterload. So your ejection fraction is the fraction of blood that ejected by the ventricle that is relative to each uh, 
filled volume. So we call it the end diastolic pressure. So we usually get the ejection fraction by, uh, by doing the 2D echo. No? Um, next. So the, par the prank starling uh, law. So this states that the stroke volume of the heart increases in response to an increase in the end diastolic volume. So the greater the heart muscle is stretched during feeling, the greater is the force of contraction and the greater the quantity of the blood pump into the aorta. Okay, next. So this is the representation of your left and right ventricular function curve. So as the atrial pressure from each side of the heart, so this is your left mean atrial pressure, and this one is the right mean atrial pressure. So as it increases, the stroke uh, work output of that side increases until it reaches the limit of ventricular pumping ability. So it means that if the left atrial pressure increases, the stroke or the st the stroke volume or the stroke output of the heart will also increase. No, uh, the for right atrium it is lower compared to your left atrium. So the value of your left atrium, as I said a while ago, is two to four, while your left atrium is uh, twenty to forty millimeter mercury. Next, so this is the approximate normal right and left ventricular volume output curve. So you will notice that your, your left ventricle has a higher pressure compared to your right ventricle. No? So this is the same uh, diagram as before. Okay, so in this diagram, as the ventricle spill, Feel in the response to higher atrial pressure, each ventricular volume and strength of the cardiac muscle uh, contraction increase, causing the heart to pump uh, increased quantities of blood into the arteries. So this one is the cardiac sympathetic and the parasympathetic nerve. So your heart is controlled by two opposing division of the autonomic nervous system. So it is composed of your sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So these two systems ideally balance each other and create a steady state. However, during stressful stimulations or situations, the sympathetic nervous uh, system predominates, which leads to tachycardia, increased cardiac output, increased oxygen demand of the heart, while your parasympathetic will cause relaxation. No? It is apparent during sleep. So your parasympathetic will predominate during sleep. So it will cause your heart rate to uh, decrease. So this is, we call it the resting heart rate. So you will also have your baseline cardiac output and also the oxygen demand of the heart is also decreased. Okay, so your, uh, your, this is the effect of your cardiac output curve of different degrees uh, of your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. So your uh, sympathetic, we call it the adrenergic, no? So your parasympathetic, we call it the cholinergic. So your parasympathetic uh, normalizes your heart rate or decreases it sometimes, while your parasympathetic increases your, your cardiac output, your heart rate. No, this is uh, responsible for the production of your norepinephrine, no? your parasympathetic. So that's why we call it the adrenergic. While your parasympathetic, uh, we call it the cholinergic, which refers to the nerve cells or fibers that employed your uh, acetylcholine, which is the primary neurotransmitter. So again, the primary neurotransmitter of your parasympathetic is your uh, acetylcholine, while your sympathetic, the primary, uh, the primary neurotransmitter is your norepinephrine or adrenergic. Okay, thank you for listening.